From deep in the heart of Central Texas, it's the Best of the Outdoors podcast. Brought to you by Texas Fish and Game Magazine, the voice of the Texas Outdoor Nation. I'm your humble host, Dustin Vaughn Warnke, the Outdoor Success Guy, back with another podcast for you this week. And man, I'm so excited to be joining you today. I thank you guys so much for listening, whether you are watching this on uh, YouTube or Facebook, or not really watching because it's a podcast, but you know what I mean. Or uh, if you are streaming it online, or if you are uh, listening on your mobile device, your phone, your tablet, whatever the case may be, thank you so much for doing so. It means the world that you are joining us, and um, I'm so excited to be here. And I get fired up with every show I do. I love this podcast medium to be able to share the outdoors with you. And I'm going to keep on doing this until my last breath, man. I'm going to keep on podcasting because I love this medium. Uh, as a way to share the outdoors with my friends and family out in the world. So, today is another destination podcast. If you remember, a, a, you know, several shows back, we did uh, James Segal with uh, Fishing and Hunting Alaska and the Kodiak Island of Alaska. And this one, we're going to be talking about New Zealand. Um, I'm doing something a little bit different outside of Texas. I know we normally talk about Texas fishing and hunting and that kind of stuff, but these destination pieces have really taken off and have gotten a lot of traction, and apparently you guys want to hear more of this kind of stuff and sponsor content for these guides and stuff that I put together. And so I just... uh, I, I, I got this opportunity through a mutual friend of me and Simon Fowler, um, the guy that I'm going to be interviewing. Um, and uh, him and I both have a, a mutual friend with Ted Johnson, who is a great uh, friend of mine and a fantastic marketing uh, associate for guides and outfitters uh, throughout the outdoors all over the world. He lives in the Philippines right now. And, um, he connected me with Simon and we had a great conversation. I think you're really going to like the show, but before we get into all that, let's do some sponsorship stuff. We haven't done this kind of stuff in a while. And I wanted to plug some new folks that have come on board with us. And then some folks that have been with us in the past. And, um, just really excited about talking about these companies because they're all really good. Uh, AccuSharp, uh, A-C-C-U-S-H- ARP.com, AccuSharp Sharpeners. Been to this factory, seen and met the people behind it. Uh, I got my first AccuSharp Sharpener when I started hunting back in 2002 from my dad. And he just gave it to me in a, in a gift, as a gift. I forget if it was a Christmas or birthday gift, but he just gave me a sharpener. And ever since then, I've given him a lot of stuff in return. He's given me a lot of stuff. We've, we've traded a lot of gifts over the years, but man. What an awesome sharpener. I still have that same sharpener today. It is a blue and white one made right here in the USA. Has um, sharpening blades that are diamond home tungsten carbide and provide years of reliable use. They obviously have for me because I've been using the same sharpener for a long time, well over 10 years. And um, that's kind of the, one of their signature products they first they're well known for is that uh, they also have some other outdoor related products. but. Um, you know, for household stuff and for outdoor stuff, knives, serrated knives, fillet knives, cleaners, uh, I'm sorry, cleavers, hatchets, machetes, broadheads, shovels, axes, hoes, and more really, really cool stuff. And so there's that one. They also have, I'm going through their catalog here real quick online, uh, Aggie Sharp Outdoors, uh, from anything from, uh, spears, spearheads, serrated knives, pocket knives, broadheads, like I said, uh, they've got some really cool, uh, portable ones or kind of ones that are more for tabletop use. And uh, we've got a wide variety of different ones. You can find these at Academy Sports and Outdoors, our, our stores here, obviously carry Aki Sharp um, products, and then um, also order them online and a wide variety of different places. But I'm really a big fan of Aki Sharp Sharpeners, and uh, they've been a sponsor of us just coming on this show, and they're going to be a sponsor of ours for a uh, a uh, few shows going forward so i definitely want to bring some product attention to them because i own their products and uh, have a lot of fun using them and uh, so check out accusharp.com that's accusharp.com for more information accusharp has two c's uh, it's uh, a c c u s h a r p dot com accusharp dot com established in 1984. Actually located right here in my neck of the woods. I live in Leander, Texas, as many of you guys know, which is northwest of Austin. Uh, they are in Cedar Park, which is just south of me a little bit, and I've actually been to their factory and their uh, their place. Uh, these things are made in the USA. Uh, a lot of the sharpeners are, and uh, they've got a really great attitude and really great um, you know concept of the outdoors. They're coming out with a lot of new cool products that are really 
excited. I'm going to tell you about soon as well. The other sponsor I wanted to talk to you about is Air Force Air Guns. They have been with us for a long time now online at fishgame.com, our website and blog. And uh, they've got a wide variety of different air guns. If you're looking to get into some serious air gunning, we Air Force Texan, which is the big bore, which is now legal to use during deer season, which is one reason why I wanted to mention this uh, during gun season. I've got a whole article at fishgame.com about using... Um, big boy air rifles for uh hunting big game and native species now usually you can only hunt with uh with the uh, air guns for exotics and hogs but state of texas and their infinite wisdom has made it um where you can hunt with uh with air guns during the uh, general season now for whitetail turkey another native game um and they've got some regulations and some suggestions on their website for that the Te texas parks and wildlife does but i have an article explaining all that at fishgame.com so you can go check that out and i feature the air force Texan as an example of a good big bore air rifle. They're airforceairguns.com. That's airforceairguns.com. Or if you go to fishgame.com, you'll probably see one of their ads. You can just click on through and uh, visit them that way. They get a lot of traffic from our website, which is really cool. So, um, but Air Force Air Guns, and they have just come out with this last year, I think this year actually, they came out with the 257, which is kind of a smaller bore um, caliber uh, for the Texan. And then obviously they have the Condor, the Talon, the Talon P, the Talon. SS, the um, uh, the Escape, all kinds of other smaller bore air guns that go from uh, small calibers to medium calibers, and then the Texan, which is kind of the bigger bore alternative for hunting big game with uh, in Texas. So, uh, and then the big the big bore in uh, Air Force also 308, 357, 45, and then the new 257 um, as well. So anyway, lots of great opportunities there for hunting, shooting, target shooting, um, getting out there, and it's a single shot air gun but it's, it's just fantastic, accurate as all get out. I own two Air Force air guns myself, and I love them both, and I highly recommend you check them out if you're looking to get into air guns. Okay, moving right along to our podcast. Simon Fowler is our guest, and he's a fantastic guest, it turns out. We did a Skype call, which <laughs> most of these calls I record on my phone. As you know, I have a, a iPhone SE. I plug in uh, this little uh, um, 3.5 millimeter jack into my system. I've got a whole mixer board and all that stuff set up here at my little podcast podcast studio in my home office here in Leander, Texas, and um, basically just let it rip, but I, I needed to do a Skype call because Simon is so international, you know, he's way out in New Zealand, it's 18 hours, I believe, time difference between him and me, so I did a Skype call on my phone, and I recorded it into my computer, so instead of most people recording Skype calls, doing the uh, doing the deals through, um, through the computer, I did mine through my phone and still made it work, so I'm kind of proud of myself there, so anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, reading and listening here is my interview with mr silent uh simon fowler and i uh, hope you enjoy it here we go joining me on the uh skype phone uh mr simon fowler and uh hunting guide new zealand i just i've never had anybody from new zealand on the show before how are you doing today simon yeah not too bad dustin yeah we're all the way across the world i guess <laughs> So to give listeners perspective, it is uh, a little bit after 11 p.m. here. It is 5.08 p.m. the next day in New Zealand yep, right now. It's Wednesday there and Thursday here. Exactly. That's where I was going with that next. It is a day apart. I mean, almost a day apart. So I think it's 16 hours or 18 hour time difference, and it's just it's wild, man. I, I just, I've always liked time zones. I don't know why, but I just that kind of fascinates me. I don't know why, but it does. <laughs> So, yeah, makes it interesting when trying to talk to clients around the world. You right. get phone calls at 4 a.m. in the morning and 3 a.m. And, <laughs> and their time, oh, it's, it's a perfect only, time to call, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's only 3 o'clock in the afternoon here. It's like, yeah, you just woke me up. <laughs> yeah, you just woke me up from a dead sleep, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. funny. It's cool. Just tell us a little bit about your background. Um, You've been guiding here for a little while, and uh, some of the things to, uh, and we'll get into obviously some of the things to look for when you're booking a trip to someplace like New Zealand, and one of the, the, the different animals you can hunt and that kind of stuff. Just give us a little background about yourself, Simon. Where do I start? <laughs> I've been guiding for the last two years. Okay. Um, relatively new company. Um, but before that, so my dad, it all came from family, really. Uh, my dad started. My dad's a avid pig hunter, mm -hmm. and when I was three years old, he used to carry me in a pack. 
just that's, a normal hunting pack. That's great. And um, hunt with dogs, and when the dogs got on a pig, he'd get close to the pig and hang me in a tree next to where the pigs were and <laughs> <laughs> go about his business. And but most of the time, I'd climb, I'd climb out of the pack and end up standing right next to him. Wow, that's a great story, man. <laughs> yeah, so that's how it all started. And then, yeah, sort of as I got older, I guess hunting was sort of part of my life and it still is. Mm-hmm. Um, moved on to bigger animals and different techniques. And I guess it was probably 10 years ago. Hunting's really my major passion and sort of went, well, I want to make this my career and my business cool and then sort of started taking the steps to becoming a hunting guide here in new zealand and um so now i'm fully registered new zealand professional hunting guide with the guides association super um yeah and i've got all my own health and safety policy everything i need to be able to guide people all around new zealand for the animals of their dreams really no, that's fantastic, and there are a couple of outfitters that I work with here that that um, that have New Zealand trips and that kind of stuff. So I know a little bit about it, but it's still kind of a world away for me because we have so many different what we consider exotics here in Texas. And to give you some perspective, Simon, I didn't talk to you about this. I should say before we started recording, but basically, um, I sell and trade. I'm kind of a day trader of a, a livestock, uh, uh, exotic livestock, hoofstock. And uh, I just sold a trailer full of red stags today for $8,000 to a ranch. So that's just one example of one of the deals that I do when we day trade exotics here. But the stags you all have in New Zealand are just a world away from some of the stuff we have here in Texas. We have some whoppers here, but you guys have some that are just absolutely phenomenally huge. Yeah. No, this. So I think in the record books at the moment, SCI record books, New Zealand's got most of the top 10. Yeah, I figured now. Um, I've not looked at that in a while, but I, I think you're you're right about that for sure. Yeah, I haven't looked for a little while, but I'm pretty sure for estate, estate stags, which are the high fence ones, we've got most of the top 10. And free range, we've got quite a few and up there as well. Sure. I don't know. I guess it's, I guess it's just the environment, the minerals in the ground. Um, the breeding stock that was bought here early on. Um, so their breeding stock in New Zealand came from England and Scotland. Yeah, I was going to ask you and that uh, next. Late 1800s, early 1900s. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, like the Woburns out of the those that sort of breed. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they just they just took off. And I don't know, I guess just the environment they were in and. It was perfect for them. No, that's, that's good to know. And the thing that's interesting about that is that technically they're not native to New Zealand, but they, they, they just like in Texas, they, they you know, expounded well. They, 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 they expanded and, and grew and multiplied, and the antler growth was there, and the, the genetics were there, and every, the stock was good, and it basically just turned into a great uh, opportunity for the commerce of New Zealand because of the hunting opportunities, right? Yeah, like, <clears throat> as you said, they've just taken off um, numbers and trophy quality here in New Zealand. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world for yeah. red stags. Yeah, no, it's I mean, great. Argentina's Argentina is close, and I mean, they might be catching up a little, but if you want those big red stags, then New Zealand is realistically the place in the, anywhere in the world you've got to go. Sure. No, that's good. And like I say, I, what would something like this typically, I know what the ranges are, but typically, I know you were going to look up airfare for a minute, you know, from from the U.S. to New Zealand, but uh, what what's your cost as far as the hunt package goes when you get there? Yeah, so flights aren't included in our package right? Cur- currently, but at the moment, so flights out of, say, Texas, to Auckland here at the moment, return are about eighteen hundred bucks. Okay. That's American dollars. American dollars, eighteen hundred dollars, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's return. Um so we specialise mainly in free range animals. 
um, uh-huh. free range, either on public land or private land. I see. Um, with our private land properties, we've got agreements with the landowners um, that we can come in and shoot predominantly the red stags <clears throat> on okay. their properties. And, yeah, in some cases, we're the only people that are allowed to do that on their properties. Interesting. Okay, um, cool. So you have like an exclusivity yeah, so got, thing with them, right? Is that what I, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we've got the exclusive rights to the red deer right. on their properties. That's great. Um, yeah, we've got in excess of sixty thousand acres. Wow. Of private, free range, red stag land. Um, yeah, so like a red stag. So we have two categories for our red stags, for free range. So we have up to twelve points. Mm-hmm. Which, which is four thousand eight hundred US dollars. That's five days, five nights, pretty much everything included. Okay, that's a part of the next question. Yeah. Your exporting cost, yeah. That includes all their food and everything. They've just got to get to the local, or the closest domestic airport, and we're into it. Everything a while on the trips paid for, for and. I yeah. see. Okay. We're there to provide them with a good time. So that's that's lodging, that's meals, that's kind of an all inclusive package aside from the flight and getting there. And once you get there, it's kind of all inclusive, and uh, that includes a, a stag, you know, of, of of a high caliber six six by six. Am I saying that right? Yeah, that's up to a six by up, six. Up to so six by six. Sort of that. Okay. And sort of a <clears throat> a four by four, so an eight pointer up to a twelve pointer. Okay. So those high. T- those high sort of twelve point animals, they're gonna be they could be anywhere up to three hundred inches. Right. Three hundred Right. That and that's a massive stag for sure. Um, yeah. Um, and then we have another category which is thirteen to seventeen points. Yes. And that's still five days, five nights. Um, that's seven thousand eight hundred and fifty American dollars. That's still not that bad, though, man. I mean, I was thinking, and some of the stuff you shoot in some parts of the world is ten grand for a trophy animal of that kind of caliber. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we try and keep it realistic. I think that's and, good. Yeah, like those stags in that thirteen to seventeen point range. Mm-hmm. Most of those stags are going to be in the top fifty SCI for free range. Oh wow, that's incredible. Um, we t- we took two stags this year, which will be in the top 50 uh, we're still waiting for them to be measured sure. but i've run a tape over them they'll go in the top 50 definitely for the year then, um, in that case or the top 50 of all time top 50 of all time oh wow that's incredible simon wow that's south pacific so that's australia new zealand right okay right right i get yeah. you now that's fantastic though but, man and then anything 18 and over is price on viewing because realistically those stags are gonna be in the top 10 and right yeah those are kind of like your unicorn Um, stags i guess is the best way to say that right yeah i mean (laughs) there might not be there might not be many out there but yeah that's what i mean but they're out there if we do see them it's price on viewing you never know year from year like this year we put a stag in front of a client that was we put it in front of him at 50 yards mm. and then that that stag was 22 points god that's a hoss man yeah he was huge and he's free range wow yeah like that stag would have i won't say would have but could have possibly taken that number one spot oh goodness did he pass on or did he take it I guess he passed on it from what you're saying, right? He passed on it that at the time, and then that evening decided he wanted to take it. Mm-hmm. We spent the next six days trying to find that stag. Oh my gosh, what a story. Obviously, because it's free range, Yeah, that's, nothing's guaranteed. They could cross the fence to the next property. Yeah, um, that's true. But yeah, like I've got a, a stag on my wall at home. That was actually killed by another deer. It was we think it was killed by a spiker. Mm-hmm. And that stag is three hundred and fifty and a half inches. 
<laughs> so he's a big 17. Wow. And at the, at the moment, I think the South Pacific free range record is 351 and a half inches. So he's an inch short. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the size does matter. You know, I mean, obviously in trophy hunting, it does, yeah. but that's amazing. And, you know, it's not just so, all about. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Simon. Finish your thought. Yeah, obviously that stag can't be measured. He's been killed by another stag. He's on the ground. So it's it's just something to show our clients. Um, oh, for sure. But the possibilities that are out have there. on the wall and sort of go, well, this is sort of the possibility of what's yeah, out there. Exactly. That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah that's great. No, yeah. um, I, I just, the other thing that captures my attention about New Zealand is the breathtaking views, the scenery, the, the people, the lifestyle. I mean, you guys have so much, it's, it's another world away from anything that exists in America. It's, it's like a little piece of paradise, I guess is the best way to say it. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, definitely. Like the scenery here in New Zealand's just, we take it for granted. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, I used to do a bit of kayaking, guiding, and things like that, and it wasn't until I started doing that and dealing with overseas clients how much we do take our scenery for granted here in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, and I've kind of, it's made me step back and sort of go, like, taking the little things, take sure. a look around, and you can't do what we do here in New Zealand pretty much anywhere else in the world. Oh, I agree. Yeah, it's a very special place. And yeah, a lot of it's just so untouched. Not Some of the end. bigger farms that we do hunt, right? Uh, they run stock on some of the farms, but some of the farms, there's over half of the farm that it's not economical for them to run stock on. In those areas, no one goes near them. I see. That makes sense. Yeah, and we take a client or clients in there, and we're going into areas that we're the only ones in there, and we know we're the only ones in there, and no one's going to turn up like some of the public land hunts that here in New Zealand. You never know who's going to be there because anyone can go on public land here in New Zealand. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guys here come to do self-guided hunts. and I mean, they come here, they do their research, but for what it costs them to come here and stuff, the extra cost for a guide, they might come here three times unguided where they could have come once with a guide and achieve their goals if you know what i'm saying sure i know exactly what you're saying yeah so having a guide makes all the difference a lot of times and that's the way it is hunting anywhere really i mean have somebody that knows the area knows where the animals are and that kind of stuff is a is a good investment i think is the best way to put it yeah i mean this last season i spent a month before any of my clients arrived just just out scouting really sure. finding out where those animals are living and yeah it's it's a different world out here, really. Oh, I know. That's, that's the amazing part about it. Uh, that all being said, I was going to ask you, Simon, what other animals are available for harvest out there? You've got red stag. I know you've got uh, some other animals as well, some other species, correct? Yeah. Yep. Um, so we do chamois as well. Mm -hmm. I figured. Which obviously, you can hunt in Europe and places like that. But, yeah, our chamois uh, <clears throat> live obviously quite high it's all public land stuff for the chamois sure uh we try and fly them by chopper to get away from the walk-in hunters <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah make it a little bit more um, challenging yeah i'm with you yeah we offer fallow deer goats pigs pigs we do with rifle and with dogs depending what people want to do um the himalayan tar as well we can offer those trips. I figured that you would offer that too, because I know that's common with a lot of New Zealand outfitters I've worked with. So yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And that you can also do, I assume, now I don't know how your packages work, but I, I assume you could do a combo hunt. Is that possible? Yeah, combo hunts are starting to get fairly popular. Okay, um, no, I figured. I've people, been have sort of that trend. Fact, people have sort of come to the fact that if they're coming to New Zealand, they might as well do as much as they can while they're here, so... Yeah, well, we're more than happy to tailor trips to clients' cool. needs, really. That's the American way right there, is we want to just shove it all into one package, you know, and try to cram it all in and get it all done, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, I mean, that's just kind of our culture, I guess, if you will. It's it's uh, it's, it's balls to the wall. But, you know, um, 
I just I I think the whole mindset of you know good management conservation those kind of things have made hunting there in New Zealand you know one of the destination places of of the entire world because y'all really have the best of of the best there with this free range or whether it's um it's high fence I mean it's it's just an incredible um paradise if you will you know of 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 rich game habitat yeah it's it's the best of both worlds really i mean we can we can offer that high fence stuff if clients want that um obviously we specialize in the free range but if people want high fence we're more than happy to do high fence with them and we've got estates that we've got agreements with we can take people into Um, for red stags and fellow bucks our power rams are another animal we can do Okay, and how? What kind of rams are they then in, in New Zealand? Are they your typical like merino style Rambolay rams, or what? What do you guys have there? Yeah, I, I guess a lot of the American clients want to come to New Zealand and shoot a ram. They can't shoot anywhere else in the world, and for us, that's the Arapara ram. That's right. Although okay. we can do mer- merino rams as well. But y'all do have merinos, right? Because we saw a bunch of those here. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. I yep, figured y'all had merinos. Merino. Yeah, merinos are the popular. And we had one gal that um, was asking me questions about buying a hunt from us here in Texas the other day, and she said, "I'd like, you know, we have, I'd like a merino or a Rambolay ram." And I'm like, "It's the same ram." You know, I mean, it was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like yeah. it's just different names for the same sheep. You know, so yeah, yeah. Our joke here is yeah. those are the sheep that you count while you're trying to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're the ones. No, there's some fairly big merino rams around. Oh, their horns um, get huge on, for sure. Yeah, on one of the farms, there's a merino that's he's got a full double kill. So wow. he's he's big, he's real big. But yeah, the Arapara rams are they're a ram that's come off an island called Arapara Island. Mm-hmm. They're generally a black in color with a white marking on their face, normally a stripe down their nose or something similar. Okay. <clears throat> um, I know a lot of the Americans that come here call them Bob Marley rams because they look like they've got dreads. <laughs> like they have dreadlocks. I love it. That's great. <laughs> Holy yeah, yeah. smokes. Are those indigenous yep, so, now to that, to that, to that Island they come off of, uh, Simon? Yeah. So they've been brought onto the mainland of New Zealand. But um, they're indigenous to that Island, correct? Yeah. Okay, that's what I figured. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I just I like to see yeah. where species originate from. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So they've been brought onto New Zealand, and then the a lot of the stock around New Zealand's bred on farms, and then either put into estates or things like that. Right. Yeah. No, that's cool. And so a combo package between like, and I don't know if you have any of this in front of you, but a combo package of like a tar. And a uh, red stag, from what I understand, is pretty popular. Uh, it, would that be, uh, and obviously excluding taxidermy and and uh, euro mounts and that kind of stuff. Um, but what what would some, what would a package like that look like? Yeah, so at the moment, I'm still working on my tar. Okay, and that's my fine. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just, but, I, but, but it's a cool package instance, hunt. Yeah, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, but for instance, just a few of the packages we have at the moment. So like a red stag up to a maximum of 12 points, and a chamois buck, which is a representation buck, which is the best we can find while we're out there. Right. So seven nights is 11 and a half grand US dollars. Okay. That's still not that bad. I mean, you save up your dimes, you know, um, to go out there and do a trip yeah. of a lifetime like that. I mean, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you know, I, I doubt anybody would regret that. I mean, something like that is, is reasonably affordable. So. Yeah, and that's two different locations. So we hunt the free range stag on the private properties. Sure. And then we come out of there, jump on a chopper, fly into the hills, and do the chamois on public land, obviously. How long does the chamois hunt take typically? Um, we like to have five days. Okay. But we can normally, three days is optimal. But the chamois hunt we can normally get done in three, but. We like to have that sort of weather window. We've you've right. got to play the weather with the areas we're going into sure. because of the high altitude you're flying into with choppers. Yeah, we do like a we we call it the wild places, wild game, big four. Um, 
it will be the big five because we're going to put a tar into it as well. Ooh. But we do a red stag up to 12 points, a chamois buck, a wild boar with dogs or without if they want to do it without, and a fellow buck in an estate, a silver medal fellow buck. Um, that's 10 nights, so that's 15,400. Yeah, Which, but still, all those animals, that's not a bad idea at all. Yeah, like, and we have a good time. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Got you as our, our guide, motto, Simon. I mean, come on. What what more better time could you have? Yeah, too true. <laughs> no, you seem like uh, a fun guy, for sure. For us, it's, the animals are sort of the the bonus. Right. It's more about, it's more about the journey of the whole hunt um i mean everyone that's hunted with us i'm still good mates with them like most of them i talk to them probably every second week oh, wow. on social media and yeah so things like that so we try and create that friendship it's about yeah it's about the journey as much as it is about the animals well, and that's the one thing about hunting, just to get philosophical for a minute, is, you know, I had some, some family in town that went hog hunting here with rifles here in, in Texas in my part of the world and the ranch that I work for and stuff. Uh, we outfitted them and they got out there and they only got one boar between the three of them and it was raining and it was just awful weather conditions and the pigs, you know, had acorns on the ground they were going to eat and they just, they just did not come to corn uh, to bait, you know, and so the thing that... Uh, you know, they said, well, Dustin, for us, it's more about the experience. It's a way to get away from home. It's a way for us to, you know, do something new, something different. And uh, it, the more I live, the longer I live, the older I get, the more I realize it's more about the process than it is about the destination and the end result. Yeah. Because, you yeah, know, the, it's the silence. Yeah. It's the silence between the noise. Exactly. And not, not so much yeah. even that. I mean, I agree with you there, but what I'm saying is it is the, the, the journey is in the process. And after you get to the destination, then what, then what are you going to do? Okay. You killed a big stag. Then what, you know, if you don't enjoy the destination, you know, and the journey, you know, it kind of cheapens the whole pr experience. That's just what I've learned over the last few years in, in hunting stuff. Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, we had a, a client earlier this year. Yep. This year. Um, I keep forgetting what year we're in, but how far away. Our season's all finished, yeah. um, and we're getting ready for next season. But we right. had a client this year, and we did a five-day trip with him. Um, he came in, he came in to shoot a red stag. He'd never seen red stags, and we put a fairly substantial number of red deer and stags in front of him. And in the end, I said to him, so are you, are you going to shoot one before the end of your trip? Because he... he Looked at probably three or four through the scope and kind of, oh, no, I want to wait, I want to wait. And he said, oh, I don't really want this trip to be over. Oh. I was like, it's it's not over. Like, you've got me for five days. Like, yeah. If you don't want to shoot one, don't shoot one. If you want to shoot one, we'll go and we'll hunt pigs and goats and do other things that we can do. Sure. And then he went, nah, I don't think I'm going to shoot one this trip. I'm going to come back next year. And he's rebooked Whoa. for next year. Oh, wow. And um, he's bringing mates with him. Um, but at the end of his trip, he was meant to go down the west coast to look at the glaciers. Down on the west coast here, Franz Joseph and Fox Joseph, Fox Joseph Glacier. Mm -hmm. And I had three days between trips. And he said, oh, what are you doing for your three days while you're getting ready for your next trip? I said, oh, just cleaning gear and getting ready for the next one. He said, oh can I come stay at your place and can we do a few things around your place? And so he came and stayed at my place. We went skydiving. We went salmon fishing. <laughs> we went saltwater fishing. We did lots of things. So that's cool. Yeah. It's, it's creating a friendship with people. Yeah. And just doing the outdoors really. I mean, we can offer saltwater fishing, trout, water, trout fishing. So mm -hmm. his next trip, he's coming back. He's doing, they're all doing red stags. And then we're doing a saltwater open ocean fishing trip for a day as well at the end of the trip. How so, cool. Yeah. That's fantastic. And, I mean, that's a sign of a good guy that doesn't just look at, at getting them in, getting them out, and a number and, and, and grinding on dollars yes. and all that other stuff that it comes to, you know, comes to fruition. You know, what, what you have to do is because it's a business. But... 
you know, somebody that cares. That's the one thing we say at Texas Fishing Game Magazine is our whole staff, everybody that's part of the group now, cares about being there and doing what they do. And I mean, I, I've often said in the book that I wrote about for, for hunting and fishing guides, you know, um, first of all, hire, hire slow, fire fast when it comes to the people that you, that you associate with. But two, you know, the, the, the communication and the relationship you have with the client should be a memorable, positive experience. And that goes without saying, but it's one of those things that I think needs to be reiterated because people should be able to trust you, you know, and really, in, you know, feel comfortable with you, to, you know, for that amount of time, for sure, for five days at least. Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's all about trust and getting to know people. Um, sure. As I said, like creating friendships, it's, it's all just a part of it. And I mean, if you don't care about the people you're with, while we're out there, I mean, should you be doing it really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's personal, and that's that's how we like it to be. Well, like I said, that's a mark of, of you being a good guide because that's one of the things I can f- read out and feel on somebody if they guide, and I deal with a lot of different guides and outfitters and work I do, but... You know, I can tell real quick if they're a quality one because of their relationship skills, their soft skills, if you will, uh, and dealing with people and dealing with new people and addressing things and taking care of things. And, you know, I mean, I can definitely tell that you're one of those. And that's, that's, that's encouraging to see because a lot of people kind of get jaded that, oh, all guys are just out to get their money. And that's just not true. I mean, it, it really, they're people that care like you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I mean... Yeah, it's just the people we are here in New Zealand, I guess. Yeah, I mean, y'all are carrying we're easy. Yeah. We're easy to get along with. Um, well, I guess it depends on the area, really. There's a few rough areas around New Zealand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a big island. Yeah, I get that. Um, the areas yeah. we're in and the places we go, I mean, it's amazing. There's no other real word for it. Yeah, sure, and I'm with you. So, uh, Australia's Aussies, you are what I, I don't want to say this wrong. You're a Kiwi. Is that the right way to say that? Yeah, a Kiwi. That's, yeah, that's correct. I've lived here all my life. Um, okay. I'm actually an Australian citizen as well, but oh, cool. hopefully no one holds that against me. Um, my, mom's <laughs> hold that against origi- <laughs> my mom's originally from Sydney, but yeah, I've lived here all my life. I have worked in Australia a little bit. Yeah, I've got a good friend that Christian. He lives in I think forget what part of Australia he lives in, but he calls himself the Rabbit Ranger, and he's just a great guy. He listens to these shows all the time. So hello, Christian, um, Rabbit Ranger, and he, uh, you know, air guns and and small game like rabbits and birds and those kind of things are what he goes after. And uh, the the difference between what you're allowed to hunt with and what you're allowed to hunt in Australia versus New Zealand is pretty significant, is it not? Am I saying that right? Yes. Yeah, definitely correct okay I mean, I just a, lot to make sure I didn't laws, a lot of laws their yeah. laws in australia are a lot different to ours um i mean i lived off and on over there for three years and and that whole time i was trying to get a gun license and it's it's almost impossible in australia to get a gun license and it's impossible in a lot of cases to hunt there are areas you can hunt over there legally but there's a lot of rigmarole or rules tape and red tape or whatever get, yeah to get hunting permissions goodness so yeah it's it's a lot different to us um yeah obviously their water buffalo over there's a big draw card for a lot of people yeah and um yeah no, we're it's... sort of looking at including that possibly some of our packages in the future and working towards that do most people, I don't know this, so I'm just going to ask you, do most people bring their own rifles of their choosing with their own scope and everything outfitted on it to New Zealand, or do they borrow yours or rent yours, or how does that work? Um, a small small minority, I guess, do. Um, it's not hard to bring a rifle into New Zealand. Okay, that's good to know. As long as you've got a license, a gun license in the country you're from, um, and it's a matter of planning ahead really sure so there's a website but you can go on the new zealand police website where you can apply for an international gun license oh okay i see Um, they recommend doing that a month before actually coming here right to give it enough time to process and Um, everything okay 
Yeah, it's a small fee. I think it's $25 currently Okay. to get that license. And then when you bring your gun into New Zealand, they just want to know where it's being kept. So if you're hunting with an outfitter, then you'll give them their address Okay. to where that rifle's going to be stored. Sure. Yeah, it's not that big a process. Um, but yeah, we have rifles and everything that people need if they don't want to bring their own. Um, and I mean, that's, that's part of their package. We don't charge extra for that. The only thing we really charge extra for is ammunition in some cases, depending how much target shooting we're doing, but a lot of cases we don't. Hmm. And favorite calibers for uh, Red Stag and, and, and other game species for that? Yeah, so I guess we're a little different to you. We, You guys are into your... 300s and 308s and that sort of thing over there. Some of us are, okay. Be, watch it there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, yeah, we, we like our, our big heavy magnums, that's for sure here. Yeah, a lot of us do. Yeah. So, like, recommending, I'd recommend something over that 7mm caliber. Okay. So my main guide gun is a 65 by 55 Okay. Uh, Swedish Mauser, right? Swedish Mauser round? Yeah, it's a Swedish Mauser See, round. I know my guns. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at least some Americans do. But yeah, that's cool. That's a great yeah. round. Flat shooting and... Yeah, that, I've just shot with that caliber for so long that it's it's a caliber of trust. We shoot dial-up scopes as well, so when our clients are getting ready to shoot animals, we range, dial-up, and they just hold where they've got to hold and oh, hold cool. the trigger, really. That's really good. So that so y'all do that as part of your guiding. That's great. So that way there's not a lot of guessing work in there. Yeah, we try and take the guesswork out of it. Um, I mean, a lot of people haven't been in front of big animals. and I mean, yeah, like you put a big animal in front of someone and you never know what they're going to do. So we try and take as much as the, guesswork the rifle out. Yeah, right. guesswork out of it. And it's, it's up to them at the end of the day. Whether they can hold steady or shake like a leaf. <laughs> <laughs> that is up to them, I assume, yes. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's, so, it's anything good, no. bigger caliber than that, um, we're looking at getting another 300 caliber, probably a wind mag, just for those bigger animals <clears throat> and people that want to shoot that caliber if they're not bringing their own rifles. Up. No. I mean, we shoot suppressed rifles with bipods and they're quite minimal amount of shock that we can possibly get through the caliber that we're shooting sure that's good and then for guns like your 6.5 by 55 swede um is that a is that a mauser that's been adapted as, as a sporterized hunting rifle or is that like a custom rifle that's built with that caliber as its caliber so it's a custom browning okay. um yeah and it's yeah with that's all suppressed and lightened and everything it, everything we thought it needed to be to be the ultimate guide gun, really. So it's a guide gun. It's built as a guide gun. The reason why is I've got this offer from a guy that I bought a lot of CNRs, what we call it here, Curion Relic um, Firearms from. He's a CNR dealer, and he's you know kind of cutting down his collection and. He offered me uh, a 6.5 Swede. I forget if it's a Mal uh, it's a Swedish Mauser. I think it's an M38 or an M30 uh, M38 or a, a M96 or something like that. It doesn't matter, but it's a, a carbine and a rifle version, longer rifle version of uh, of the Swede Mauser. And I've just the accuracy on that caliber. I mean, that's one reason why the 6.5 Creedmoor is such a big hit here in the states because it shoots flat. Um, it, it shoots far and it, it knocks stuff down. And I know the 6.5 Swede is really uh, very similar in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing caliber, really. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just, I think, from memory, some of the research I did when I bought mine a few years ago was it's one of the flattest shooting projectiles that you can get in any yeah. rifle. Oh, that's what I figured. I, I've not done that much research. I'm thinking of buying one of his guns is what I'm saying. Cause you're turning me on to this caliber, okay? So that's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, out to out to 500 yards, they've still got that energy. Right. With, especially the projectile we're shooting. Um, 
you've still got that energy right. to knock down a reasonably sized animal. And to go for that more energy, obviously, you need to go to a big cal- bigger caliber. But, I mean, I've shot goats at 850 yards. With wow. It. And that, that 6.5 is flat shooting, too, which is another nice thing because it's a smaller projectile. Yeah. yeah. I don't mean to get all into calibers and guns and stuff. I just don't talk a lot about that on the show. And I, I think it's good to at least educate people on, on what the possibilities are. You don't have to just use your granddaddy's 30 odd 6 to hunt. Um, we have so nah. many different calibers here in America, though, you know. But the 6.5 yeah. uh, Swede is just a fantastic choice, I think. So I agree with you. Yeah, it's a great all-round gun. I mean, I've shot animals with it at 20 yards and animals at 850 la- oh, yards, buddy. like I said. And it's still knocking them down. Yeah, for sure. That's crazy. And it's like, I keep going, oh, I need a bigger caliber, I need a bigger caliber. But this gun's just constantly knocking them over. Um, all right, so real quick, what season is 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 hunting season there in New Zealand? Because y'all have different seasons than we do, correct? As far as the different parts of the hemisphere. Yeah, we're pretty much a complete opposite to you. Okay. So our our guiding season, we the red stag roar. You guys probably call it the rut. Yes. <laughs> um, generally, because it's temperatures it's all sorts of different things come into when it actually begins when the high or does come on heat and all sorts of different things sure. come into it mm-hmm. but gen- generally around that first of march is sort of when things start kicking off oh, okay so um, kind of after... it can be earlier it can be later so our season we try and start around that mid february okay early march um so the rut normally lasts between two and three months, so sort of March through May. Okay, so there's a lot of hunting that happens in between those 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 months. Yeah. Yeah, and the stags are start stripping their velvet sort of mid to late January. So sort of February through July is when the red stags have got are in hard antler. Okay. And they sort of drop around mid mid August. They start dropping dropping their hard antler. Sure, I understand that. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Keep fellow going. deer pretty much run on from them. Um, their rut sort of overlaps. Okay. Quite often they they happen at the same time. Um, but generally the same sort of season for the fellow deer as well. Can I just say that the first time I heard a red stag roar, I was in a hunting stand here in Central Texas on a high fence ranch that has a lot of exotics and I thought that the apocalypse was going to start. That was the scariest noise I'd heard in the dark in a long time. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you've obviously heard heard them roar, but it's like a barking almost. It's like a really glutteral, you know, yeah, sound, a noise. Yeah, that's more like a lion than anything. A else lion, like. yeah. That's what I was gonna say. It's more like a roar. Well, that's what y'all call it. Is a roar? Is is a rut period? Yeah. But. It's it's unlike anything yeah. you ever expected to come from an animal like that. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and it's it's addictive. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, that is for sure. Um, I mean, we we shoot bows over here as well, and the thrill for me is getting in real close. That's right. what it's about. And um, like even this season, just getting close to some of those big stags while they're roaring and there's other stags coming in and there's satellite stags and that's that's what it's all about really <laughs> and uh, yeah as you said that roar is it, it gives you chills yeah it does it gives me chills it gives me chills too <laughs> even the smell yes like that rut that rut smell i mean if they could bottle that i'm sure you, you can sell that to people as cologne yeah, yeah, it's real musky. I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, similar to them, the the fellow, the fellow croak that they call it. Mm-hmm. Um, they're like a frog type croak, but they sort of overlap each other. Those two ruts and yeah, a, a lot of people that come here to New Zealand like to do both animals because they can get both ruts or raw at the same time kind of a two for one deal yeah i like that a lot that's cool that's a good opportunity yeah, yeah. um and then the chamois sort of roll on they sort of start their rut around that april 
through May and June. And I don't know a lot about um, this, but do y'all have set seasons to hunt these game, or is it a year-round thing because they're exotics, or how does that work? Uh, we can hunt them year-round. Okay, that's good to know. It's I just, didn't know that. It's it's just the optimal times. Okay. Uh, obviously, the most popular while they're in the rut or the raw or in their rutting period. Um, obviously, the chamois bucks are looking for nannies and traveling a bit more, and they're a bit easier to find. Okay. The same with the Himalayan tar, the same. Like They sort of roll on from the chamois, sort of May, June, July are the optimal times. Um, but, yeah, everything sort of rolls on from each other. That's fascinating. That's it's just how how animals that come from different parts of the world, you know, essentially, you know, have just just get in sync with each other in in a another world, kind of. You know, I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, the only real season we have is our waterfowl season, so ducks. Ducks, okay. Um, ducks, pheasants, quails, and that's that's May, beginning of May till end of July. If you had um, to say, oh god, I'm sorry. No, carry on. I was just gonna say, if you had to say, as far as how many people bow hunt versus rifle hunt, I assume a majority of them uh, rifle hunt. Um, but how many bow hunt? What would you say as a percentage? Probably at the moment, here in New Zealand, probably ten to twenty percent would be bow hunters. Oh, really? Okay, good. That many? Okay. But that's obviously rising. Um, I mean, the bow hunting is only just starting to kick off here in New Zealand. It ha- there has been bow hunters here in New Zealand for a long time, but it's just sort of getting traction. As... I mean, I've only been bow shooting myself now for four months. I shot my first animal last weekend. Oh, great. Congratulations. And... Yeah, and then it's, it's a different experience. Um, it is. And it's, I can probably say fairly well myself that I won't be rushing to pick a rifle up again. <laughs> Most bow hunters <laughs> would agree with you, yes. So yeah, it's it's an addiction. It's a gil- ex- <laughs> exhilarating to get that close to um, to something and put an arrow in it. And I'm saying that while I'm wearing my Grim Reaper broadhead shirt, you know, and my gold tip <laughs> arrow hat, you know, and I'm I'm a big fan of those brands because uh, I use them a lot here in Texas for uh, for hogs and deer and, and other exotic game. And you know the <sighs> I don't know what your preference is because I know you're still a new bow hunter, but I mean, I prefer a good mechanical like a Grim Reaper um, two inch whitetail special that that basically will go through and get you a lot of cut radius, but a good pass through. And it did, you know, versus some of the smaller micro heads or some of the the, the fixed blades if you can use them. Um, you know, as far as accuracy goes and everything like that, I just prefer mechanical. There are a lot of guys that like to prefer fixed blade, but I don't want to get in that whole argument. I just wanted to bring that up. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, obviously being a new bow hunter, I'm sort of still learning. But sure, with your with your expandable, does it shoot different to your field points? It does not. Okay, that's and good. a lot of them a lot don't. of fixed a lot of them don't. A so. lot of fixed blades do shoot a little bit different. Yes, that's what to I'm saying. Yeah, the field points. That's why I like the mechanical. So I'm shooting. Yeah, I'm shooting a fixed blade, two blade. Mm-hmm. From Ozcut oh, cool. broadheads in Australia. Okay, cool. And they're shooting bang on like field points and broadheads. There's no difference. Fantastic. That's great. It's good to find one that tunes well like that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's from what I've done with it so far. It's it's a great broadhead. Like I shot my first animal at five yards. Mm-hmm. And straight past through the animal didn't even know it was hit it turned walked away and sat down 20 yards away and died fell over yeah and that was it wow yeah what did you shoot i mean it's doing what i need it to do right no i understand that what did you shoot what what animal did you take with it i shot a goat first okay cool good um yep i'm hoping to shoot some next animal for me on my list is a red deer and then i'll probably look at pigs and that after that but i want to shoot a red deer um and really get as 
close as possible. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's that, it, it, there's very few. I mean, a lot of guys will say if I'm going to go spend that much money on a red deer or a tar hunt or a, a chamois hunt or whatever, I'm going to use a rifle because it's guaranteed, you know, pretty guaranteed that I'm going to have a shot opportunity and I'm going to make it happen. But there's something that is just blood, just blood pumping about being that close to game that doesn't detect that you're there. And I yeah. think that, it, and then uh, Dustin Ellerman, good example. Dustin Ellerman and I went to Shot Show this year around the time SCI came came to uh, to, to Las Vegas, and we were at Range Day at uh, one of the rifle clubs there, local to Las Vegas, and. Um, he got to shoot an Excalibur crossbow, and he owns a Raven crossbow that he won on one of the other deals we were at in 2017. Well, 2018 this year, he goes through and shoots a, a Excalibur Assassin, which is their new crossbow, at 100 yards. And the thing is, the the he said it's so cool to watch that arrow crest and just drop right into the bullseye. And I said, that's what Ted Nugent and the other guys here in America call the mystical flight of the arrow. And there's something that's just special about that in bow hunting world that I I can't explain, but it's just, it's special is what I'm trying. And you understand that, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a whole next level yes. type of hunting, really, if you're into it. Right. Um, watching that arrow drop away and hit its target, it's... That's exhilarating. It's, oh, yeah, and it's it's like it's, you've accomplished what you want to accomplish. Yes, yes. You I mean, you shoot, you shoot a bullet, you don't see it, and it's flight. Whereas with an arrow, especially getting out to those bigger distances, it's like, have I done everything I need to do right? Right, yep. No, and then it all. hits its mark, and it's like... Yeah, it's, it's a good feeling. That. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good feeling. <laughs> but uh, no, bow yeah. hunting is great. I mean, I haven't talked about it a lot on the show here lately, and I just wanted to bring that up because there's something special about it. And, and it's more for the advanced hunter that's shot a lot of stuff with a rifle. And a lot of people have only picked up a bow their whole hunting career and have never, never, you know, messed with dealing with rifles, and that's all they prefer to do. But it's it's for some of us that have hunted for a while with a gun that have just put a gun down and basically go. And I, there's still some places here in texas i can only gun hunt i cannot bring a bow and i i'm kind of forced to do my video work around that but i mean man it's just uh archery is hard to beat so that's all i'm saying yeah i mean nothing against people who shoot with a rifle at all like nothing wrong with that at all but for someone who wants that next challenge in the hunting and their hunting career sort of thing mm -hmm. like Pick up a bow. Yeah, pick up a bow. Have yeah. a go. Yeah. I shoot agree. some targets and just keep shooting those targets till you can group inside an inch or 50 mil. Right. And then, yeah. Practice, 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 practice. Yeah, that's so important with bow hunting. And crossbows make it a little bit easier, but it's it's still, you know, getting close and being, you know, the skill. Uh, mad bow hunting skills, as they say, you know. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, yeah. that's that's wildly important. Yeah. So. Um, well, listen, we've been on here for about an hour. I don't want to keep you any longer. I know you got to get to your evening, uh, and I've got to get to my night, uh, or my early morning here pretty soon. Um, the, um, anything that you would like to close with Simon? Um, just thanks for getting in touch and yeah, it's been awesome talking to you. Sure. And just, yeah, if you come into New Zealand, want to hunt, give us the L. It's all about the journey and adventure awaits really the best place to probably find us is um so company's called wild places wild game uh-huh um we're on instagram snapchat facebook google plus yep youtube and we also have a website um the website is wild places wild game dot com mm-hmm um or flick me an email um i'm keen to talk i like to get on the phone with people like we're doing now obviously get to know you like people. to talk obviously <laughs> i'm just messing with you <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing get though. to know people and sort of well, i like to tailor trips to what clients want sure. rather than them just looking at the trip and going well that doesn't suit me right you, you can you Give can customize call. yeah right Give me a call. My phone number's on the website. 
my email is on the website. But the email, if you just want to flick me an email, is wildplaceswildgame at gmail.com. Okay, super. And I'll put all uh, that in the show notes. I just wanted to make sure I, I plugged you first before we left. Not a problem. That's super. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Simon. I appreciate you. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. I have all of his information in the show notes. Fantastic guest. I was really excited to have him on the podcast and um, really uh, had an opportunity to share a lot of great information about bow hunting and fishing and hunting and uh, red stags and chamois and tar and uh, fallow deer and all the different things that New Zealand offers. He's a great guy to uh, to give a call and, and kind of talk about if you'd like to plan an international trip there. But one of the other reasons why I wanted to have him on the show and do New Zealand podcast is just because it is a it's a world away from here in Texas, uh, where this show is based and where Texas Fishing Game is based. But it's also a really great destination to consider for the future. And it's not a cheap hunt, you know, it's not a cheap adventure, but it's something that a lot of people go as a trip on a lifetime. And I'll probably in the future have some African guides on. I've had Alaskan guides on. Um, you know, I'll, I'll have some other guys that kind of do these international things because I, I just like to dream outside of our great state, even though we have so many great hunting and fishing opportunities here in America and especially here in Texas. Um, you know, it's just great to kind of branch out and uh, learn some more about what other people have in, uh, in, in the world as well and the world away from the world, you know, New Zealand, but, uh, it's really cool. So if you've not done so already, please subscribe to our newsletters. They are free. Come out every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You have tactical and practical Tuesday wildlife wednesday and the thursday texas state of the outdoor nation um those are all free like i said uh, sign up form at fishgame.com there's a right sidebar sign up for uh just putting your name and email in there and you'll get on that list our list is over 60,000 now for that email list and we put out great content a lot of my stuff in fact this Tuesday that this podcast is releasing on a third Wednesday or Thursday, but this Tuesday I have two articles that I've written about game cams and about, um, oh, what was the other one, gun cleaning, um, in the Tactical and Practical Tuesday. Both of those articles in the Tactical and Practical Tuesday newsletter were mine and on fishgame.com, so I was kind of stoked about that. Uh, I'm writing one right now on blood tracking and a flashlight that I used in the video I just did on my YouTube channel. If you've not done so already, I've got all my videos and all my links to all my articles and stuff like that at DustinsProjects.com. Look me up there. Click on through Facebook. Tell me that you're listening. I've had a couple of guys do that here recently, and it just makes my day. It makes my socks go up and down when you guys tell me that um, you like the show and um, and that you're listening and that you appreciate the work that I put into this thing because it is a lot of work, but uh, I love bringing this to you. This is just cathartic, which I mean therapeutic for me uh, to do this show and to uh, basically just branch out and, uh, and do some different stuff. So I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you guys so much for watching, reading, and listening. Have an awesome day in the outdoors. We'll see you next time.